A past president of the Organization of American Historians, Richard White, is an historian and a professor at Stanford and the author of notable books on the American West, Native American history, and the environment. I realize as I read those words, that implies there are other less notable books that he's also the author of. That's not what I meant at all. Those are just the ones that I'm aware of. Um, a recipient of the Mellon Distinguished Professor Award and a former professor at the University of Washington. His work has won numerous academic prizes and he has twice been a finalist for the Pul Pulitzer Prize. Uh, White was the former director of the Spatial History Project at Stanford, which implements digital technologies and analyses uh, to illuminate patterns and anomalies for research. He is the author of numerous books, including Railroaded, The Transcontinentals, and The Making of Modern America from 2011, 1991's The Middle Ground, uh, Indians, Empires, and Republics in the Great Lakes Region, and 1996's The Organic Machine on the Remaking of the Columbia River. His latest is The Republic for Which It Stands, The United States During Reconstruction and the Gilded Age, 1865 to 1896, which is published by our good friends at Oxford Press and is the subject of tonight's talk, but you knew that already. Please join me in offering a warm town hall welcome to Richard White. Good to be back in Seattle. As the uh, introduction mentioned, I taught here in the 1980s and 1990s. And before that, I was actually a graduate student here in the 1970s. But when I came back this time, I thought of something else which I actually hadn't thought of in years, which was the first time I came to Seattle. And I think probably it was the traffic that inspired me to think about it. Because <laughs> the first time I came here in 1969, I was driving a Volkswagen van full of Nisqually Indians, um, fishing rights activist, activists from Frank's Landing down near Olympia. And somewhere around Tacoma, we lost our brakes. And I remember saying, we've lost our brakes. And I remember them saying, keep driving. <laughs> Which I did. And it's a testimony to my own stupidity that I kept driving but also to the gentleness of Seattle traffic in those years that we actually made it into Seattle and that I'm still standing here <laughs> today. I'm going to talk about the book, which is, as everybody knows, a very big book. Um, as a matter of fact, the daughter of one of my friends said it was the biggest book she'd ever seen in her life. <laughs> and it's certainly the biggest book I ever intend to write. You might think that Oxford University Press commissions these books by the pound, and in a sense they do. They are meant to be very big books. So what I'm going to give you tonight is a short attention span theater version of the book. You're going to get the big themes and the takeaways, but I won't go into a lot of the details. You can ask about those and the questions, which is the part of the talk that I always look forward to the most. There's no lack of American historians who want to write about the Civil War, World War II, the New Deal, but the Gilded Age, the period between 1865 and about 1896, is usually flyover country. It's remembered mostly as the golden age of facial hair, as you can <laughs> see here. And these are the American presidents who are the most forgettable presidents in American history. Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, James Garfield, the immortal Chester A. Arthur, who actually has a new biography out about him, Benjamin Harrison, Grover Cleveland. There's an age of Jackson. There's an age of Lincoln. There's an age of Roosevelt. There's no age of Benjamin Harrison. But we should be careful before we consign this period to a backwater. Because if it's a backwater, we're living in one too. We're living in a second Gilded Age. It's a parallel that's often been made, and I think it's a very good parallel. I can start with the parallels. They're obvious and they're abundant. Partisan stalemate, check. Immigration and reaction, check. Corruption in both politics and business, check. Rising inequality, double check. Environmental crisis, check. Claims of white supremacy, check. Attempts to restrict suffrage, 
check. All of these things were true then. All of these things are true now. And I could go on. The period did not produce important political figures. It's not that there weren't important figures. They just weren't elected to office even when they were engaged in politics. Perhaps the most adroit politician of the time was Francis Willard of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which is now parodied, but which is a very serious political organization in the late 19th century. She not only couldn't hold office, she couldn't vote. Political activity went beyond holding office and even beyond voting. Ida P. Wells was doubly disbarred by virtue of her gender and her race. But there's nobody in the late 19th century who did more to lead the attack on lynch lynching. She did far more than any elected official. In literature, it was a distinguished age. This is a great age of American realism. Mark Twain. William James, William Dean Howells, who really forms my guide through this book, Hamlin Garland, Edith Wharton, Charles Chestnut. And if we look to popular culture, it really is the invention of American popular culture. This is the period of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, which is a mass spectacle which will tour for more than 30 years. I would even say that Buffalo Bill Cody is the only real genius ever produced in the American West. It's also going to be the rise of the mass press. And it's going to be the rise of professional sports, particularly baseball. It is creating an American popular culture, which from then until now is probably the most influential thing about this country. But the key to the period is a phrase that William Dean Howells used. The sufficiency of the common. This was an age obsessed with Lincoln. David Kennedy, who's the general editor of the series, pointed out that the only great president and the only hero in my book was Abraham Lincoln, and he died on the first page. <laughs> and that is true. The Gilded Age will never produce anybody remotely like Lincoln. But Howell's point was, in the end, that really doesn't matter. He says, it's the insufficiency of the uncommon and the sufficiency of the common that matters. He says, if America means anything at all, it means the sufficiency of the common, the insufficiency of the income, uncommon. And I think. In a democracy, the sufficiency of the common is ultimately all that matters. If the common fails in a democracy, then it's all over. The uncommon will never save us. But how sufficiency of the common can seem a thin thread during the turmoil of the Gilded Age, and it can seem a thin thread to us today in the second Gilded Age. In the Gilded Age, things did not work out as people imagined. They were astonished to find themselves living in a world that many of them had never predicted and never intended to produce. It's a feeling we can have sympathy with today. In 1865, the Civil War ended with the North triumphant. The Republican Party was in the saddle. There's probably only been one other time in American history, the New Deal, where one party held such great power. And the Republicans knew what they wanted to do with it. What they wanted to do was create a world of a homogeneous citizenry. This is a Thomas Nast cartoon, one that he wouldn't stick to his whole life. But the idea was that unlike before the Civil War, everyone entitled to citizenship in the United States, and in NAS cartoons, some who weren't, 
would have an equal set of rights, and those rights would be guaranteed by the federal government. That same federal government would spread free labor across the entire United States. The age of slavery and coerced labor was supposedly over. Along with them would spread the sovereignty of the United States. The, United, the Americans claimed the whole continent, not the whole continent, but the present continental United States, but they didn't control it. By the end of the period, they would control it. If you want to know Republican ambitions, and I would say the ambitions of, the, of Reconstruction, it boils down to this. This is Springfield, Illinois, Abraham Lincoln's hometown. It was a place where the great pilgrimage after Lincoln is assassinated will bring him back to Springfield to be buried. It's Lincoln's house in Springfield. And the ideal of Reconstruction can basically be all of the United States will look like that. The South, the West, is going to be remade over into a version of the Midwest. They imagine that is where we are going. That is what they could achieve. That's not where they were going. And that's not what they achieved. What they achieved was this, which is not a bad thing. It's just totally unexpected. That's Chicago in the 1890s. They achieved not a small town America, but an urban America. They achieved not a nation of small producers, they achieved a nation of wage laborers. This is not a world of small shops, this is Pullman factories in Chicago or outside of Chicago. And these are workers, many of them not born in the United States, immigrant workers coming off of work. It wasn't going to be a peaceful world of small producers. It was going to be a violent world. And one of the things that happens in the book is I do not overplay the violence, but neither do I downplay it. The United States, in terms of public violence, was a very violent place in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s. The question is, going between Springfield and Chicago, to quote another author who has a book out this month, what happened? <laughs> what happened is really the subject of this book. In any history, large trends are very often going to overtake the intentions. But intentions do make a difference. Not everything was a failure. The United States did, to its great credit, abolish slavery. It would not abolish coerced labor. That would return in various forms, but it did abolish slavery. And it would expand across the continent. We tend to forget how quickly that happened. It had taken two and a half centuries for Americans of European descent to get from the Atlantic coast to about the 100th meridian, about halfway across the continent. It took a generation to get the rest of the way. And this famous lithograph, American Progress by John Gast, symbolizes this. And for many years, I, like many university professors and teachers, taught this as a symbol of American expansion in the late 19th century. In writing this book, what I discovered, as a Lucinda Williams song has it, is that everything is wrong. <laughs> this is a picture of early 19th century American expansion. It has nothing to do with late 19th century American expansion. The first thing you can look for is what is missing. Certainly there are Indians retreating, the buffalo retreating, immigrants and pioneers going west, the railroad following them, Lady Liberty with the school book in her hand trailing the telegraph wire. But the problem is what's not there. There's no United States Army. There's no federal government. The Indians retreat because of American military force. The railroads advance because of government subsidies. And the railroads don't follow, they lead. The settlers come because the railroads recruit them to sell land. 
Virtually everything this symbolizes has nothing to do with the way the country actually developed. And the other thing to keep in mind, and I say this even though I'm a Western chauvinist, <laughs> is that in the late 19th century in the West, there's a lot more land than people. That if you look back, the population of the West throughout the period I'm talking about is going to be very, very sparse. In 1890, the collective population of Chicago, New York, and Brooklyn exceeded the 2.8 million people who lived west of the 100th meridian. And if you took San Francisco out of the equation, then New York and Brooklyn alone would have contained almost as many people as the Rocky Mountain states, the Pacific Coast states, and the Southwest. We conquered the West. We dispossess Indian peoples. But by and large, it is not going to be the golden age of the West in the late 19th century that we often portray it that way. It's going to be the golden age of the Midwest. Immigration is going to be much more important than Western expansion. Now, you can't detach the two. Many of the people who settle Washington, California, Dakotas, the majority of the people in some states are going to be immigrants. The immigrants are going to come in and settle in the countryside, but they're also going to settle in cities. And as you can see here, when you take southern and eastern Europe, starting about 1890, the United States is going to be much more diverse. What southern and eastern Europe means is Catholic and Jewish. A country which had been largely Protestant is going to be much more diverse. The homogeneous citizenry which most Republicans, unlike Nast, imagined, would still be a Protestant country. And it would remain a Protestant country by 1900, but with a much larger proportion of Catholics and Jews. It's also going to be a country which industrializes. Between 1839 and 1899, manufacturing output increases 40-fold. By 1900, in a vision of ourselves we still hold, I think, the United States had one half of the world's manufacturing capacity. One half of all the manufacturing capacity was in the United States. Corporations were still largely confined to railroads, but larger companies are becoming more and more dominant, and Americans hate it. This is the Southern Pacific Railroad, but I could reproduce a slide like this for literally every minute of this lecture. I could reproduce it for every second of this lecture. There is going to be a fear that this economic growth is being dominated by the rich and the powerful. And small producers are going to be the victims. By 1900, 80% of manufacturing workers are within factories. But in 1865, like in Lincoln Springfield, it had been a world of small shops and businesses. The inequality becomes symbolized in the things that we associate with the Gilded Age. This is the Pullman Mansion on Prairie Avenue in Chicago. This is the Vanderbilt Mansion on Fifth Avenue in New York. This is an alley in back of the yards in Chicago. We were supposed to be a Goldilocks country. We're supposed to be in between. But suddenly, we were becoming a country of what they called at the time the dangerous classes, the very rich and the very poor. The American dream, to use a word that we still use, in the 19th century was not great witches. It's something called a competency. A competency meant you earned enough to support yourself, to have something to tide you over hard times, to provide your children with a start in life, and to take care of yourself in your old age. And that's what you wanted. You didn't want great riches. You wanted a competency. But now we've used, the competency begins to vanish, and that is why they begin to talk about the dangerous classes. One of the hardest things to do in the book 
was to figure out whether all of these changes benefited ordinary Americans. And I'm not going to go into the economic literature, but many of you have seen the graphs which show starting in about 1800 with industrialization in Europe, production goes way up. Wealth in the world goes way up. And it really does. There's, there's no arguing about that. The question is where the wealth goes. And 19th century economic statistics just simply are not good enough to measure that with any reliability. We don't have good statistics on economic income. So what I did following economists and demographers is make a basic surmise. If Americans were get, being more prosperous in an urbanizing, industrializing world, then it would be that they'd be healthier. And the marks of being healthier was that they should be taller, they should live longer, and their children should not die in great numbers in childhood. And from all the studies we've done so far, none of that is true. This is 1800, and as you see, the trend line goes down through much of the 19th century, rising up only in the end. If Americans were growing shorter, if Americans were living shorter lifespans, if their children continued to die in huge numbers, then it seems to me that something was going dramatically awry. If you measure just GDP, yeah, American grew. But GDP is not about distribution. And again, I won't go into the details, but even if you look at the growth rates in the 19th century, they're marked by sharp recessions and depressions, roughly every 10 years. And then much of the growth in the United States is going to be building things like railroads, roads, infrastructure, cities, buildings, all of which increase the country's wealth, all of which make an industrial giant, but few of those things contribute to individual consumption. There was a good reason that there's so much conflict in the Gilded Age. There's a good reason why there's so much violence in the streets. Ordinary people thought their lives were getting worse, not better. And there's a lot of evidence that ordinary people were right. But my question is, how did they understand it? How did they begin to try to understand these changes they never intended, which were beginning to shape their lives? And the answer, it's going to be incorporated in the home. One of the things I've learned to do as a historian is sort of follow my inner idiot. Um, whenever I have a question, I've learned that the answer is probably pretty obvious, but I'm ignoring it. And if I stay on it long enough, if I keep the question there and don't try to convince myself I've really answered the question when I haven't, the answer will occur to me. It'll occur to me because usually it goes around something which is repeated over and over and over again. It's the kind of over here, over here, over here. And over here in the 19th century is the home. It's a word that's absolutely ubiquitous in the 19th century. When Americans tried to understand who they were and what the nation was, they talked about the home. When they talked about gender roles, they talked about the home. When they talked about race, they talked about the home. When they evaluated whether changes were good or whether they were bad, they talked about the home. The nation was less a collection of individuals than it was a collection of homes. That's how they understood the United States. People's success in life was going to be made around creating a home. These are from mug books in the Midwest in the 19th century. And you can repeat them endlessly. The first home in the woods. The end of a successful life through creation of a prosperous farm and a home. Homogeneous citizenship, it's going to be the black people, too, can now have homes. Over here, the horrors of slavery. Over here the difference of freedom, but at the center is the black home, 
the black family, and of course, Abraham Lincoln. But the problem is that the home's always double-edged. Part of the violence during Reconstruction by the Ku Klux Klan and other Southern terrorists is going to be attack on the black home. And they were not wrong. They realized that if they could show that black men could not protect their home and black women could not sustain their home, then black people were not worthy of the privileges of citizenship because citizenship revolved around the ability to maintain a home. And so we get to some of the most terrific symbolic violence of the period. Night riders show up outside a black cabin, and the details differ, but they're all equally horrible. A black wife is raped in front of her husband. A black man is tied to a tree and lashed. Sometimes he's castrated. Sometimes he's murdered. Sometimes they're just more economical. A shotgun appears through the window, and they fire indiscriminately at black families, men, women, and children. But the goal is subordination. You cannot protect your home. Single working women are seen as a danger to society in the 19th century because they are not attached to a home. They are called, in the terms of the period, women adrift. The Chinese are going to be made into the great symbols of the threat to the home because supposedly they can live on nothing, why they can live on 40 cents a day, while a white working man needs a living wage to sustain a home. If you bring in Chinese, in the Sinophobic literature, you are going to destroy the white home. And the white home is, for working men, such as these workers' cottages in Chicago, the point of their attaining a sufficiency. They are going to be, this is their aim in life. They can achieve that. And a threat to that is to them a threat to everything they hold important in life. And I could go endlessly on. What do Indians do in the 19th century? They attack the home. They attack settlers. They attack families. They attack the home. To fall outside the home in 19th century America is to be stripped of your rights and to be not worthy of citizenship. And it's not just racial. The problem with tramps, homeless people in the 19th century is they don't sustain homes. And they are seen, too, as a danger to society. Willard's genius is that you can base a politics on this. There's Francis Willard, the Home Protection Manual, which is the key of the reform movement in the Women's Christian Temperance Union. But what Willard makes clear is this was an age of reform. People did not sit quietly as these changes transformed the nation. And we often frame it as an age of laissez-faire and individualism, but I don't think it was at all. It's not that those things weren't present, but I don't think they were dominant. Americans in the 19th century thought in terms of collectivities. They thought in terms of homes. They thought in terms of churches. They thought in terms of voluntary organizations. They thought in terms of unions. They could despise government, and for very good reason, but they also expected government to act for a collective good. And in terms of laws and authority, government was extraordinarily powerful in the late 19th century, but it lacked administrative capacity. And it's one of the interesting parallels with today. The government had the power to do all kinds of things, but it did it through subsidies and through delegation of authority. It rewarded public officials by allowing them to collect fees and make money off of their office. This is the reason the corruption was so great during the period. You want to build railroads? You subsidize massive corporations. You want to support prisons? You take the prisoners and you let them out to private parties who in the South and in the North very often work them to death. 
The idea for many Americans was to, to encounter, govern, encounter a government official is to encounter somebody who would try to make money by providing you with a service. Why the United States shifts over to bureaucracy is to avoid that, to avoid fee-based government. Because in fact, we've tried that in the 19th century and it proved an incredible failure. One of the nice things about writing a book about the Gilded Age is that I get to quote Mike, Mark Twain, who gave the age its name. It's actually a great title to a novel, but don't bother to read it. There's much better stuff for Mark Twain. But at the end of the period, Mark Twain wrote, quote, there is no distinctly Native American criminal class except Congress. He would add that the political and commercial morals of the United States are not merely food for laughter, they are an entire banquet. But Twain is in part unfair, because by the 1880s and 1890s, reformers were actually taking over the legislature. They were actually taking over Congress. They not only dominated the third parties, greenbackers or the populists, but there were powerful factions in both the Republican and the Democratic Party. The result is going to be tremendous social conflict, but also this powerful reform movement. Anti-monopolist parties, the Knights of Labor, the Farmers Alliance, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. It's going to be a period where, in fact, great wealth is seen as resulting only through government favors. How do they explain the rise of great fortunes in the 19th century United States? They see it as the government bestowing favors. And again, the parallels with today are clear. Tariff, they argue if you have tariffs, what you're going to do is reward certain industries and allow them to make profits which they ordinarily would not be able to make without government intervention in the economy. Subsidies are the same thing legislation that favors some people over others, and that all of this allows a few to tax the many. That was the way the Gilded Age reformers looked at this. And the resistance to it is not just going to be political, it can be violent. This is the homestead strike. What's lying down here is a rifle. What you had is bitter battles. In this one, armed workers versus the Pinkertons. The Pinkertons were on that barge. The Pinkertons lost. And what happens afterward is not going to be pretty. Nobody's going to be killed, but the Pinkertons have to run a gauntlet, not just of angry workers, but of their wives and children. This is going to be a period, as I've said, of incredible violence. It's going to reach its culmination in 1896 with the election between William Jennings Bryan and William McKinley. But I'd argue by 1896, it didn't matter who won that election. The basic question had already been answered. Whether the populists win and they really didn't have a chance, whether Bryan wins, whether McKinley wins, Americans had agreed that whatever was going to be the solution to this kind of social conflict, to the kinds of problems they confronted during the Gilded Age, government was going to be the answer. All of them agreed on that. They differ on the details, but they agreed on that. Progressivism is not inevitable after 1896, but it's really very, very likely. And that's what's going to follow. Now, to conclude, it's not just even, or it's not just mainly that we can find seeds of the present in the Gilded Age that makes it important. The seeds of the present are there, and I'm not going to deny them. As a matter of fact, I've mentioned many of them as I went through. But the problem is it's more important than that. The danger of just trying to find clues to our present world in the past is that it trivializes the past. All that matters out of all the lives these people lived are the things that made them just like us. And if all we're interested is in people just like us, 
why bother? We can study us. We're a wonderfully ahistorical nation. We're obsessed with ourselves. You can't follow modern politics without thinking the last 10 minutes are the most important in all of human history. What the past is going to give you is something else. It's the strangeness of the past. It's the difference of the past. It's the ways in which an age like the Gilded Age, which sort of parallels our own, still can come up with ideas that we don't have. Things that seem unfamiliar. The idea of a competency. The Gilded Age was about fighting, and fighting means there was more than one way to be American. When Americans believed in a competency, they believed that, in fact, great wealth was, should not be the ambition of human lives. They believed in a concept which hardly seems to apply to the early 21st century, which is enough. I've made enough. I have enough. I don't need any more. That's not a conception which seems to describe us. They believed in home, which is not that we don't have concepts of the home, but what they're really after is it's not going to be self-reliance. It's going to be human dependence, human effective relations. There's something more important than self-fulfillment that the American world is a world of homes. And homes mean effective relations. They believe in a word they used over and over again in cooperation. They don't believe that most things in life come out of individual genius. They didn't believe that about their technology, and they were right. What they believed it came from was cooperation, from the sufficiency of the common. In the midst of the conflict and corruption of our own Gilded Age, it seems to me these are not bad take-home lessons from the earlier Gilded Age. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you. That was a very interesting presentation. My question is uh, your choice of terms you chose homes over families. Was there a reason, or is that just a random choice of nouns? No, the reason I chose it is that's the word they used. Um, in the 19th century, you could, I ignored it and ignored it and ignored it, and I realized if they're using this word over and over again, they mean something particular by it. And they used home. It's not the family didn't exist, but the ideal was the home. And it's in home sweet home, the sanctity of the home. So that's their word, not mine. That's why I used it so much. Hi. Uh, Hi. During that time, there was like at least one major financial panic. Um, I think it was 1893. And how did that weave in with the Gilded Age? And do you see any parallels to today? Yeah. Um, there are three of them. There's going to be 1873, 1883, and the big one is the one you got, 1893. And the way it wove in is what the government will do is subsidize an economy, but there's very little regulation of that economy. So all of the economy, all of the um, depressions are in a sense going to be railroad depressions, not because it's all just the railroads, but because the railroads are big corporations. And the, and the um, short version of this is it's much like the recent housing panic. Credit is extended. These railroads could not possibly earn enough money to pay their debt. The way that they stayed in business was they kept borrowing more money. At a certain point, people began to worry about their ability to pay them back. Loans are called in. And then you get this cascade in which everything collapses. It is pretty much the way virtually every American panic and depression has taken place. But with no regulation in the 19th century, it takes place every 10 years. And they are catastrophic. I mean, the big ones can last five or six years. So the boom times can be quite good in the 19th century, but the depressions are quite deep and quite real. What are the three greatest lies or myths we've been taught about the Reconstruction? About Reconstruction? Well, if we're, we're going to talk about Reconstruction by historians has been going on a long time. So I will take popular ones rather than the, the, um, 
the ones that historians have, have undercut since the 1970s. And the major one is that the South was abused by the victorious North. I would say never in the history of a major civil war has the loser gotten off as easily as the South did. The war was terrible, but there's not going to be punishment from the South. The other one is connected with that, and that um, is that there was a threat of terror against white families in the South. Terrorism is all one-sided in the South. It is going to be terrorism by whites against blacks. And the other one is that um, Reconstruction could not possibly have succeeded. And I think it could have succeeded. There's recent literature that shows the biggest mistake that the North made is they withdrew their troops. And there were reasons why they did it. But the North is passing a bunch of laws with no ability to enforce them. Once you have the troops gone, it is pretty cheap to take a black life. And very little is going to happen. Whenever the North intervenes with troops, as against the Ku Klux Klan in the Carolina, South Carolina, the Klan can be destroyed. But very often, there is going to be no use of that kind of force. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Um, I, w I wanted to ask about reparations. The, um, the Republican-dominated Congress and the Republican Senate and a Republican president signed the reparations of 40 acres and a mule and education for the enslaved African Americans. Uh, they were never given this because I think of the assassination of, of the president and then the new administration came in. What is your take on why this didn't happen? And would you go a little further and tell me what you think would have taken place had it happened? Okay. Um, there is going to be an attempt at reparations. It's largely during the Civil War and it's largely wartime. It's not, Congress will authorize it, but it's going to be that they will take land from Southerners who have been committed treason against the United States, largely big plantation owners, and it'll be divided up among black slaves who had been slaves. It gets real complicated because sometimes this even works to the ability of whites who then basically turn black slaves into sharecroppers, but I won't go into that. After the war, the plan is, is that in fact there should be a reparation for slavery. That after two and a half centuries of black labor, you cannot just say, well, that's over now, we're going to forget about it. And the Argument is for 40 acres and a mule. That will never, ever be authorized. There will be no reparations given to ex-slaves. Well, it's, 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 it's a, there's a wartime measure which allows you with wartime powers to take them, but there is not anything which is passed after the war as peace comes in which will allow you to solidify this and to take the rest. As a matter of fact, everything that was taken during the war is given back. So people who had worked this land for two or three years had to give it back to the old owners. It, if it had been passed, I'm of two minds about it. Um, certainly in the terms of any sort of social justice, it should have been passed. But what you would have had then is a group of small black farmers. And we can compare them what happens to small white farmers. Small white farmers in the South did not do real well during this period. Most of them end up in sharecropping and then moving out other places. The danger is, is that simply giving land might have simply turned black sharecroppers into landowners who became sharecroppers again. My guess is they still would have been better off, but I'm not sure if it would have been a solution. Um, certainly reparations had to take place. And in fact, if you could have guaranteed education, some kind of reparations and protection, reconstruction could have worked. But I don't think 40 acres and a mule would have been magic enough unless you enforced all these other things. Uh, very interested in your uh, graph of longevity and height. There appears to have been a bump yeah. in the late 60s, and then, and then more interesting is a, de a decrease afterwards. What was the factor that created that bump or factors? That's a very good question. It's a very easy question for me because you got me. <laughs> Demographers cannot explain it. Whether this is just simply a flaw in the statistics or what, why it goes up there and then falls again immediately, we don't know. It's one of the problems with these statistics. Uh, so uh, two years after the end of the Gilded Age, 1896, the country gets involved in a colonial war in both Cuba 
in the Philippines. And um, I think what I've read was that, you know, this is an expression of the country's incipient nationalism. Can you talk a little bit about what you see are the themes that are leading the country towards now looking outward to a colonial war for the first time? Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why I ended the book in 1896 instead of 1898, because I didn't want to address that question. <laughs> but I haven't answered that question, but this is a really long book. And I thought, do we really want two more chapters? I don't think so. Um, but, the, but the answer would be, that the way historians look at it now, and I think this works partially but doesn't work perfectly, is remember, we had been engaged in colonial wars all through the 19th century. We had been conquering Indian peoples and incorporated them into the United States. All that happens as we reach out into Hawaii and then the Philippines is in fact that we are continuing what amounts to a series of Indian wars, except this time there are going to be places, not so much in Hawaii, but the Philippines and in Cuba, where the we don't displace the population. There are simply too many of them. We don't make Filipino reservations. Instead, what we do is take on a more European colonialism where we administer these territories, draw wealth out of them, and in that way, it differs from what we did in the continental United States. So on the one hand, yeah, it's just an extension of what we have been doing, but in another way, it's qualitatively different. So my question invites speculation. You've talked about the Gilded Age and how uh, inherent to it were sort of uh, seeds, trends, patterns that uh, gave rise to the progressive area. And you've argued that both parties ended up sort of agreeing that government was going to be the solution uh, to the problems of the Gilded Age. And then you've also said that now we are in a second Gilded Age. So my question is, do you see um, the seeds inherent to our age that portend the uh, sort of onset of another major progressive era? I'll probably be dead by the time this comes to fruition, so <laughs> nobody can criticize me, but I would say yes. I would say that in fact what we are reaching now and the way that this parallels the other is, this, is a set of things which are so unsustainable and a social conflict that is so deep that if it is not solved, then in fact the country will face precisely the crisis that we faced in the, in the Gilded Age. And my guess is that already that is taking shape. You're not going to see it probably in the next four years. You're probably not going to see it in the next eight years. But my guess is younger people in this audience will see it and will look back on this just in the way that I'm looking back on the Gilded Age. That in all that turmoil, all that conflict, all the things which seem to be tearing the nation apart, there were actually seeds of the solution. Um, the great advantage of being a historian is you get to see the solution after it's been made. It's much harder to see the solution when you're in the middle of it. And we're in the middle of it. But I tend to be, I have a great reputation as being pessimistic, but I always think of myself as an optimist. I always think, we can get out of this. <laughs> we've never seen something quite like this, but we've been in bad positions before, and we can get out of this. Uh, thank you. I, I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about the challenge of periodization. The historian's task is to sort of define an age and a period and what makes the late 19th century the Gilded Age and not something else. And so you've written a book that is both about Reconstruction and the Gilded Age, two periods that we traditionally think of as distinct, but you have this sort of one uh, larger work about it. And I wonder if you, what sort of, in the talk I didn't hear discussion about either both the similarities and differences, is it really just one big era? Or are they, is this a, are they really quite distinct, the era of Reconstruction and then the era of, of the Gilded Age? Okay. Are you a historian? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know a historian when I hear one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you the short glib answer than the serious answer. The reason I combine them together is that Oxford University Press had combined them together. And they combined them together about 30 years ago for reasons I'm not sure of. But once I'm given it, I can always think of a reason why they go together. And 
The reason is for me, Reconstruction, particularly as historians talk about the greater Reconstruction and um, talk about the real end of Reconstruction is in the 1880s, is Reconstruction goes deep into the Gilded Age. And if we're going to talk about the Gilded Age as this period in which um, wage labor takes over in the United States, industrialization, those, and the rise of corporations and corruption, those things start during, the, during Reconstruction. So I would say Reconstruction is a phase of this larger Gilded Age. So having been giving the concept, it might just be proof that I can talk myself into anything. I am, after all, the guy who drove with no brakes from Tacoma to Seattle. Um, but I think it works. This next question will be our last one for the evening. Just looking at, looking at your dip there. Uh, the uh, urbanization probably was a tuberculosis, uh, cholera, whatever, you know, <laughs> malaria, all sorts of diseases that made the dip probably in the 1800s. You know, the dip in the 1800s, you're perfectly right. This dip right here yeah. is going to be um, tuberculosis. I think the question is, what's that improvement? And then it falls right off again. But you said the seeds were... So in of public health then, too. I know you I mentioned Cheeseboro and Chicago yeah. and the sewers, even here in Seattle. They put them in the 1800s. Oh, did, the have you read the book? Most of it. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I've encountered somebody who knows who Cheeseboro is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was the seeds of public health, basically. Yeah. That made it go back up, right? Exactly. I mean, that's why here it starts going back up. Not here, but here. It's going to be public health. All right, well, thank you, Richard White. <laughs> so these, uh, what's in it for these rich people, though, okay? Because why do they want it to be this way? If we had a full employment economy, right, wouldn't that mean more wealth for them? Mm -hmm. So uh, well, what, what are they trying to do here? So several things. I mean, I'm not sure they can be any wealthier than they already are. But remember, full employment economies are also the ways a co countries come together and democracy heals. People believe they can start to work together to solve social programs, and wealth inequality is one of those problems. So a un un high unemployment rate where people are fighting one another and you have militias and people are living kind of these symbolic lives, no one's going to come together and no one's going to address wealth inequality. A high unemployment rate is typically historically a precondition for this situation because the social breakdown is exactly what the wealthy really want. Eliminated unemployment, I think, is an important step to starting to work back together, and that opens the door for looking at this inequality and understanding why it's unjust and it can be dealt with. We don't need to tax the rich to fund programs. We need to tax the rich as because of the political power they have and about the gross inequality that can be eliminated by taxing and destroying their wealth. They don't want that. So social breakdown is exactly what they want. I mean, sometimes the political is more important than a little bit of extra profit because a healthy democracy is more of a threat to them later. And as I said, historically, and you can look example after example, when you want to move to a more authoritarian society, one of the first thing you do is, it, is try and push the unemployment rate up. Well, that's the that that's maybe that's a good question. Um, MMT says that despite the terrible things they're doing, if we understood this and used this, despite this, we could still rebuild a livable society. Yeah, that's an important point. And then, once we've done that, the political healing of having be able to work together to have a full employment, living wage society, and heal the divides does mean we're in the political space to go after some of those other issues. But you're not going to get there until you've addressed unemployment and people feel like they can work together, right? So I, I do remember a talk that Noam Chomsky gave back during the Clinton years, any Bill Clinton years, right? I mean, things are much worse now. And he pointed out that there's this, the United States has a level of cults that he said is unheard of in Europe or any other industrial society. And this is back with the militia. And he pointed out that that reflects the lack of a functioning unions that used to be able to organize exactly these people to work together 
and feel good about working together to build a new future. With automation and the job loss, that job loss that's coming, the unions are not going to be able to provide that function. But modern money can. Modern money is the way we can work together to go to full employment and have that employment be healthcare, education, childcare, community healing, dealing with the climate change with a living wage, where we can actually work together to make these happen because it's win-win. My gain is your gain, right? I make solar panels, that's good for you, right? And basically push to eliminate all unemployment and increase productivity so there's more goods and services for everybody else. And at that point, other political goals become possible in a way they are not now, which is the reason why unemployment is desirable to them. Even if they can make a little bit more money with full employment, it's not what they want, and they're taking the long view. Cold blood, but that's the long view. Does that answer your question? Okay. And I was just about to make another point, and I lost it at that point, which is too bad. Oh, Social Security. Um, one of the points that was made about Social Security being insolvent, which of course is ridiculous in a fiat currency that's not possible, but someone made the point that if you limit unemployment and that $9 trillion of output had not been lost, there would be this huge resource base that would make it possible for much more generous pensions. Stephanie Kelton made that point. So by eliminating unemployment and increasing productivity so that we're a much more rich society, we can allow for better pensions for everybody. Again, win-win. And it costs nobody anything. Everybody's given meaningful work for which they have respect and people respect them. Like you build solar panels, you take care of children, you take care of sick people. I mean, this is the kind of thing people can feel proud about and everybody else is proud of everybody else. That's a very different society than the one we have now, where people are told you're downbeat, you're not making your mortgage payment, you're this, you're, I mean, they're blaming us for everything. And people are saying, well, it's not me, it must be Muslims or black people, whoever it's gonna be, right? And again, that's, they do that on purpose. And modern money, I think, is the way to go to a full employment society with respectful work addressing issues and building the political space at that point to go forward and deal with the climate in time, hopefully, partly in time.